Okay, good evening. Welcome to the Elk Grove Unified School District Board of Education meeting tonight. Apologize for a little bit of delay with some camera activity. The board did meet in closed session and no action was taken. Today's meeting is being video recorded and will be available on the district's YouTube channel. Blue cards are available at the table just outside of the boardroom for anyone who wishes to address the board. If you wish to address the board, complete the card and hand it to a staff member to my right here. Be sure you, uh, to indicate whether you want the matter you wish to address is on the agenda or not on the agenda. Tonight, we have the Pledge of Allegiance from Joseph Sims uh, Elementary. I want to call on Karen and Louis Serrani, Serrani and Principal Robin Riley and be assisted by Miss Bobby Singh Allen. Welcome. Come on up. All right. Joseph Sims Elementary School is honored to recognize Karen and Louise Seriani as our education partner. Karen and Louise are proud grandparents of first grader Giovanni Rose. When Giovanni first entered kindergarten at Sims, they began volunteering in Mrs. Bishop's class. Throughout these last two years, Louise and Karen have cheerfully done whatever is asked of them. They pulled apart workbooks and collated pages and stapled packets, worked with students and listened to them read or review sight words. When Giovanni went to first grade, Karen and Luis went with him. At the beginning of the year, when our first grade classes had to move into new rooms to make way for additional PALS classes on campus, Karen and Luis were ready with support. They brought their vacuum cleaner, cleaning supplies, and mini toolbox to help with cleaning carpets, spackling holes and walls, reattaching the pencil sharpener to the wall, and taking out hundreds of staples left in the walls. According to Mrs. Deanna Kelsey's, Giovanni's first grade teacher, my list was unending, but Karen was always willing to take on new challenges. Karen is very thoughtful, and the kids love and trust her. Without Karen and Luis's help this year, I would not have been as organized, freed up, freed up and able to focus on the pure joy of teaching my delightful first graders. The Sirianis always ask how they can help. Their timely offer on many occasions brought me to tears. Their kindness and availability to do anything is very humbling. Thank you, Karen and Louise. You are so appreciated and loved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you like to say anything? Well, we just thank you and we feel honored to be here. And uh, we really love Joseph Sims. Yeah. The Very school, so. it was easy to volunteer for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And then uh, <laughs> turn around here and we can come take my money and we'll take a photograph. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Okay, we'll have our high school representative reports. Warren High School, come forward. Good evening, President Madison, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos. My name is Ronisha Smith, ASB co-president. And my name is Abby Chow, ASB co-president. It is our honor to be here tonight representing Florin High School for one last time. 
Before walking the stage exactly a week from today, we'd like to show our gratitude and give a major shout out to our retiring dearest principal, Mrs. Escobar, for embodying such great eminence, serving as our principal for the past three years. She truly defines what it means to be extraordinary, and we know that in her heart, she'll always be a Panther, as she is leaving with the best graduating class, might I add. <laughs> Senior year has been quite a ride for the both of us, but the highs and lows are definitely what truly makes high school special. As the time for the seniors to say goodbye quickly approaches, we would like to reminisce on some bittersweet moments. As college acceptance letters started rolling in, it left us seniors in awe. Although it gave us a feeling of excitement, it left us a little afraid for what is to come in the future. We were left with a very difficult decision to make. Although it was extremely nerve wracking, we finally made our commitments and accepted our admissions. I am proud to say that I will be attending Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in the fall as an animal science major. And with over 16 college acceptances to choose from, I have decided that I will be attending Sacramento City College in the fall with the set goal to transfer to UCLA in two years. I'd like to congratulate all the seniors in this room for making it this far, and good luck to you and all your future endeavors. <laughs> to those who are not yet seniors, good luck. <laughs> it's a crazy ride, yet memorable. During the first week of May, we were all able to celebrate our seniors' many accomplishments at the Seniors Award Night. Eligible seniors were presented with their graduation cords, stoves, medallions, plaques, and much, much more. Friends, families, and teachers were able to come together to congratulate the seniors for their hard work and dedication while also, ha also having a sweet treat to snack on. We would like to give a special thanks to Superintendent Hoffman and second Secondary Director Dr. John Dixon for attending the event. Florin greatly appreciates your support. We would also like to recognize our Florin Law Academy juniors as they took home the victory against McClashey High School in the 2019 mock trial competition held at the Robert T. Matsui Federal Courthouse in downtown Sacramento, sustaining our undefeated streak. With weeks of practice with students from Lincoln Law School, our Law Academy juniors delivered dominating performances while gaining trial skills and having the opportunity to embody what it feels like to be an actual attorney in a criminal case. In addition to that, we'd also like to recognize four law seniors who participated in the Operation Protect and Defend contest. Laura Zhang, who won the grand $1,000 Robert K. Baguglia Award for the most original and inspirational essay. Brianna Gutierrez for obtaining the $250 Bion M. Gregory Essay Recognition Award. Giselle Hernandez for receiving the $200 Teacher's Choice Award. And yes, in the flesh, I myself for winning the bronze $300 award in the Modern Masters of America Art Contest. Congratulations to our Foreign Law Academy for all of their successes this year. Right. Our Foreign Ag program has been making the most of the last couple of months of school by taking many different educational field trips and preparing rabbits and turkeys for the upcoming fairs. They're currently in the midst of fair preparation, which consists of our show teams weighing, tagging, and washing their animals. This Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, they will be competing at the county fair. After all of the time and effort that they have put into their animal animals, we are hoping that each and every one of them are sold during the auction portion of Fair Week on Sunday. Good luck, Ag. Our choir program took their annual trip to SoCal just two weekends ago to attend the Forum Festival, where they graciously won and received gold standard awards in the following categories. Show choir, concert choir, and vocal ensemble. And you know what? It gets even better. A week after the competition, our committed and hardworking choir program put on another astounding show at their annual spring choral concert. This event was the last show for many of our choir seniors and was full of love, diversity, and student leadership as they sang songs in Fr French and African. Many of the seniors performed solos and even conducted parts of the show. Our arts program was in the spotlight again with our theater performance of the play, You Can't Take It With You. Students and teachers, some who have never even seen live theater, were completely amazed and all of the credit goes to Mr. Nauman, our theater director, and the amazing foreign cast members for never failing to amaze the audience. At this year's open house, Florence Quad was transformed into a welcoming and friendly environment by our very own teachers. Everywhere you looked, you saw teachers interacting with their students and their families with fun games and activities. Our amazing visual arts department displayed our students' beautiful paintings, drawings, and pottery creations in our commons for everyone to see. There were also amazing performances by Florin High's choir, as well as our masterpiece dance company. Everyone who went to open house saw Florin's talent on display. Just because it is the end of the year does not mean Florin stops celebrating. 
As a matter of fact, tomorrow we will be celebrating Pride Day. Florence Associate Student Body has been working tirelessly on this event as it was a huge success for us last year, uniting both teachers and students. In our quad tomorrow, there will be an abundance of positivity being spread around as we hold activities, informational games, teacher and student bonding time, and many more. Everyone is accepted, everyone is loved, and everyone is welcomed. When the third quarter began, there was only one thing on the minds of the juniors and seniors, gala. This year's theme was Carnival de Benicia. Our version of the famous carnival featured vibrant colors, masks, and all things Italian. And when I say all things Italian, I truly mean it. The students were served pasta and different flavors of gelato. After completing, completely stuffing our faces, we were able to enjoy each other's company as we danced the night away. Moving on to athletics. We would like to congratulate our men's volleyball team for making it to playoffs once again, placing second in, greater, in the Greater Sacramento League. They never failed to amaze as their season was unforgettable, having an almost undefeated record. In addition to the success of our volleyball team, after long and tiring practices out in the cold weather, our men's swimming team won the GSL championship with the highest overall score, and our women's team earned third place. On top of all, on top of, all of it, many of our sw swimmers placed overall in the league. To say that our swim team had a great season is an understatement. Thank you, and I mean graciously, Thank you for your continued and endless support. And exactly a week from today, as we turn our tassels from the right to the left, our high school experience may be over, but our Panther pride lives forever. Here to end us off, one last time, I know that all of you guys know it, you know, and I know, that every day is a great day to be a Panther. Buzz show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Elk Grove High School. Evening, Board President Madison, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avlos. I'm Bella Harder. And I'm Alex Taniguchi. And due to our recent report only being last month, we will be keeping this one short and sweet. May is finally coming to an end, which not only means that summer break is a few short weeks away, but also that AP testing is finally over. Now we can all finally breathe and enjoy the rest of the school year. On April 29th, we held the top 10 dinner for our seniors. Here, families belonging to the students who received the 10 highest GPAs of the senior class were gathered together to celebrate their students' past four years of hard work. To follow up that great event, we continue to celebrate our other outstanding seniors last night at our Senior Awards Night, where hundreds of students were given countless awards, cords, and stoles. Making all students who attend Elk Grove feel unified and welcomed at our school is our top priority. On May 2nd, our annual Art in Action Chalk Drawing Show was held. Here, students had a chance to show off their creative sides by creating a large chalk drawing in our main quad. Let me tell you, Elk Grove has some amazing artists. April and May are hands down the busiest time of the year for our FFA organization. In April, we proudly announced our new officer team, and then within a few short weeks, we sent our chapter off to state finals in Anaheim. There, the power trio, Bella, Sam, and Sophie Albiani, represented Elk Grove FFA at the Creed Public Speaking Competition and swept the whole competition. Bella placing first, Sam third, and Sophie fourth. What a talented group of girls. But the hard work doesn't stop there. Currently, as I'm speaking, our chapter is at the fairgrounds getting prepared for a long week at County Fair. Our drama department worked so hard preparing, preparing for the spring musical Chicago, which occurred on April 4th through the 6th, and the theater was packed with families and students. We are absolutely amazed by our, by our theater program and their amazing talent every time we see them perform. Our very own Elk Grove High School Environmental Club, including other Elk Grove schools, made an appearance at Elk Grove City Hall on May 8th to advocate for banning styrofoam to the Elk Grove City Hall. We had a variety of support from teachers and students, and we even had our own students speak upon this matter, making an appearance in the newspaper. The men's volleyball team absolutely dominated this season. They finished their season 11-1 in league, qualifying them for playoffs. 
They pushed through all their games, and we we're proud to announce that Elk Grove men's volleyball team now are Northern California champions. What a great season. Baseball has had a long competitive season as well. After some huge wins, the team pushed their way to playoffs, winning the first round against Yuba City and sadly losing to Oakmont in the second round, but they still put up a great fight. We also want to recognize a few of the track and field team members that qualified for the San Joaquin Section Masters, including Hunter Hall, Kelly Vieira, and Elijah Vallier, and many more. Congratulations. Board President Madison, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos, we sincerely thank you for the time you have given us all year, and we cannot wait for our next report with you next school year. However, before we go, we would like to thank and congratulate our Vice Principal, Randy Stark, and one of our beloved biology, biology teachers, Tony White, on their retirement. They have impacted so many lives here at Elk Grove. We would also like to add that our seniors' graduation will be held on Friday, May 31st at 3 o'clock at the Golden One Arena, and we would love to see you there. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful report. I want to recognize the principals, Dr. Eugene uh, Christmas from Elk Grove High School. and uh, Ms. Denise Escobar from Florin High School. <laughs> On the behalf of the Board of Education, Ms. Escobar, we wish you well. I've known you for a long time, and uh, we, you're sorely going to be missed over there. And I wish you well on your retirement. Thank you. <laughs> With that, I want to recognize, call on Mr. Greg uh, Murray to come up forward, and we want to recognize all the board representatives from each high school. And I'd like the Board of Education, we can all go down as well. Thank you. Thank you, President Madison, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and of course, Ms. Avalos. Um, tonight, we're asking the board to recognize our 2018-19 student board representatives. During the 2018-19 school year, the Board of Education has been kept apprised of academic and athletic activities, as well as special programs and events through excellent, informative, enthusiastic reports delivered by our outstanding student board representatives. As board representatives, these students have spoken on behalf of their peers and their schools and have served as valuable liaisons between their classmates and school rec uh, district administration. And so tonight we're here to honor them. From Calvine High School, Isaiah Robertson and Jacob Hernandez. From Kasumnas Oaks High School, Mike Ann Wynn and Armand Shergill. <laughs> From Elk Grove Charter High School, Gavin Rainey and Oscar Infante. From William Daylor High School, Kanisha James. From Elk Grove High School, Alexandra Taniguchi and Bella Harder. From Florin High School, Abby Chow and Renisha Smith. From Franklin High School, Matthew Jumamoy and Ashley Rehall.
from Laguna Creek High School, Caden Ellison and Haley Rankin. From Las Flores High School, Vianne Marie Toribio and Jessica Myers. From Monterey Trail High School, Javin Nanka and Tamur Ali. From Pleasant Grove High School, Amanda Pangilinan and Ebenezer Shankut. From Rio Casadero High School, Alexander Lopez and Jesus Alvarez Cortez. And from Valley High School, Brittany Ng. You all may be excused for the last time. <laughs> Go home and get prepare for your finals.
Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, I'd like to call on Ms. Pinkerton to be assisted by Ms. Albiani on the Student Educational Video Award winners. Good evening, Board President Chet Madison, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Avalos. So um, this evening, I also am going to uh, ask Mr. Steve Mate to join us up here, along with um, Ms. Liz Rhodes. Um, tonight, we're going to be rec asking for recognition of the 2019 Student Educational Video Awards, also known as the SIVA winners, but also the SIVA Studio Labs that are at a variety of our schools in the district. Um, so Steve Mate is also the chairman of the Sacramento Educational Cable Commission, and Ms. Liz Rhodes is the executive director, or also known as the supreme one. So <laughs> <laughs> she does everything. She's wonderful. Um, the board is going to be asked to recognize and receive a brief presentation about the outstanding work happening across the district in the area of animation, videography, filming, and newscasting through the Sacramento Educational Cable Consortium grant. Um, before I go through everything, I'm going to ask Ms. Um, Rhodes to come up and say a few things about the SECC. Um, and also, we're going to show a little presentation, and then we'll ask all of the representatives from the SIVA Lab schools to also join us for to receive a little recognition piece. Good evening. I am so excited to be here because it is such an honor for us to work with your teachers, your schools, and, and your students. You have some talented, talented people. Before I go too much further, though, I'd like to introduce two staff people that are here from SECC that really help make this SEVA program um, work. And that's Abby Jaspe in the back and Nick Conklin. You may recognize Nick because he's homegrown. He's one of your graduates, and he's also a graduate of two SEVA programs, one at Toby Johnson and then from Franklin High School. And he's our newest employee, and we are so fortunate. So thank you for turning out such amazing people. He's an incredible, incredible employee and person, high quality. You guys have done a good job. So I want to show you a real quick video. We have put SECC, which is a, a consortium of all of the educational institutions here in Sacramento. We have put about so 50 of these um, studios throughout the, the county and schools. 10 of them, 10 of those 50 are in your district. So what we've done is we've put together a real short video that's going to give you an overview of the 10 that are in your school and then highlights from our SIBO awards, which are going to meet some of your student tonight, but you'll get a feeling of what our Oscar night, hosted by Steve Mate, was all about. <laughs> and I also want to point out, because I saw a couple of the students have actually brought their SIVO awards. And those awards are made by the same company that makes the Oscars. So we have our own homegrown Oscar ceremony here. So with that, if we could just look at the video. program here has just elevated the quality of work that you see in all of our classes because when students can watch the morning broadcast and see what their peers are capable of, they look around and go, I could probably do that. Being able to not only do something I love, but help people in the process, it's just, it's like a, a double whammy. I love it. When I gather with a bunch of like-minded people, it's just such a great energy. Video, to me, uh, means everything. Like, I never found something so just freeing because video allows me to just express myself.
would definitely encourage other schools to, to have a media program because it becomes part of the school culture. I think having the ability to give students access to this experience, it's important. And I really think it brings a lot to our school and to our community. So in addition to the outstanding work being done at 10 of our SIVA labs across the district, and I'll name those briefly, those um, SIVA labs that we have are specifically at Florence Markoffer Elementary School, led by teacher Tammy Knoll, Herman Leibach, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Her, uh, they can, you can start lining up now, yeah, sure. Herman Leibach Elementary School, taught by or led by teacher Erica Swift, also from Sunrise Elementary School, it's run by teacher Trevor Harding. <laughs> and also from Joseph Kerr Middle School, um, Jeanette Demi is the main teacher there. At Samuel Jackman Middle School, uh, the teacher is Lauren, uh, Laura Harmon. And at Toby Johnson Middle School, the teacher is Dana LaChapelle. At Kasunas Oaks High School, teacher Timothy Youngs leads the way. And at Franklin High School, there's two teachers, Don Williams and Brad Clark. <laughs> and at Monterey Trail High School, teacher Daniel Athey runs the program there. And at Pleasant Grove High School, it's teacher Jerry Bandy. <laughs> We have a couple of other schools that do get involved with video production, and the, it does, you don't have to have a SIVA lab in order to participate in the SIVA awards. Um, and this year, I know Alisa, this from Alisa Donner, there were some uh, two teachers who've been very involved in a production club, and that's Kevin Broxton and Guillermo Ramirez are very involved there. And also, um, our own teacher, um, John Archie Sr., is very involved over at Rio Casadero as a media teacher. So we have a lot of great things going on. Um, in addition to the outstanding work being done at the 10 SIVA labs across the district, uh, paid through the Studio Lab grant programs, the Elk Grove Unified School District received a total of 11 awards at the 2019 Student Educational Video Awards, SIVA. The most awards received by a single school district, so within the Sacramento region, so we're very proud of that. Additionally, 23 videos from Elk Grove Unified School District schools also scored near the top of their respective categories with each receiving an award of merit. Students from Florence Markhofer, Harmon Leinbach, and Sunrise Elementary Schools also conducted the red carpet interviews, which are a lot of fun, as guests arrive and, and get to take part of the award show. So in a competitive field of the nearly 500 submissions to this year's SIVA awards from the 10 Sacramento County School Districts, 10 EGUSD schools submitted nearly 100 video projects. Eight schools received honorable mentions with six receiving SIVA awards. So it was a wonderful turnout. Um, we're gonna present each school with a little recognition piece, just telling, you know, uh, thanking them for their, for their hard work that they've been doing. Um, and the communications department looks forward to using all of those 100 videos as we can, because several of them, they may talk about uh, mental health, they may be talking about recycling, a lot of great things, and throughout the year, it's, it's excellent content that we can use in social media, online, on our YouTube channel, and you know, further promote their efforts. So from Herman Leinbach Elementary School, Florence Markhofer Elementary School.
Sunrise Elementary School. Samuel Jackson Middle School. And from Toby Johnson Middle School. We also had Joseph Kerr Middle School. Kasumnas Oaks High School. Franklin High School. And Monterey Trail High School. Thank you so much. <laughs> and our last Siva Lab Studio School, Pleasant Grove High School. Okay, I'd like to call on uh, Miss Jennifer Avey, uh, Time of Remembrance. Good evening, President Madison, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Miss Avalos. At the February 5th board meeting, the board took action and reaffirmed February 19th as an annual day of remembrance in Elk Grove Unified School District in honor of our Japanese American and Aleutian families who endured the denial of their civil rights during World War II. As many of you may be aware, Mary Sukamoto, the late Mary Sukamoto, an Elk Grove educator and lifelong civil rights activist, created the original Elk Grove Unified School District Time of Remembrance program in 1983. 
Mary's daughter, Mary L. Sukamoto, is in collaboration with the Northern California Time of Remembrance Committee, the Florin Japanese American Citizens League, and the California Museum continues the work of educating the public. The Time of Remembrance program was originally held in our district boardroom and was well attended by our students and community members. Matter of fact, I was a young teacher many moons ago and, and listened to Mary as she spoke to our students when I brought my own fifth grade students. As part of the effort to educate a broader section of the K-12 students and the California community at large, the Time of Remembrance program was moved from Elk Grove's district office to the California Museum several years ago. Elk Grove's fifth grade students made their visits to the Time of Remembrance exhibit at the California Museum January 28th through March 22nd this year, where they learned about the Japanese internment and about the rights denied to US citizens during World War II. I wanna thank on behalf of our whole division the California Museum for their continued generous support extended to Elk Grove this past year. Uh, they again offered us a reduced cost of admission for Elk Grove students, as well as eliminate the cost for the two classroom chaperones that need to attend. This generosity allowed Elk Grove's fifth grade students to participate in this worthy endeavor. At this time, I would like to introduce Marielle Sukamoto of the Florin Japanese American Citizens League, Ron Rohovit, Education Director of the California Museum, and Christine Yumeta of the Northern California Time of Remembrance Committee. Uh, they join us tonight to update the board on Elk Grove students' participation at the Time of Remember Remembrance exhibit. You're not going to join me? <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Well, thank you. Let me start by thanking you for this, op this opportunity to be able to report tonight on what I really believe is an, not only an exemplary program and an effective program, but really an exemplary partnership. And that's what makes this educational experience so, uh, so wonderful. And here we are. I'm going to back up just a I'm getting there, okay. Um, the partnership, which is a wonderful partnership, uh, working with the Japanese American Citizens League who are here tonight and uh, provide us with just outstanding volunteers who share these first, uh, who share these firsthand stories and very powerful stories about what took place in the incarceration camps and the experience before and after the, uh, it took place. Also, we value the partnership with the Elk Grove Unified School District, the teachers who put in the hard work to prepare the students for the field trip to ensure that they get the maximum experience, having kids read Journey to Topaz, uh, doing other activities, pre and post victab activities to prepare them for the trip. So we really appreciate and value uh, this partnership. And the presentation is moving with it's it's great so so the numbers this year as you can see the overall 3,008 uh, participants from Elk Grove came to the time of remembrance program uh, keeps going ahead we had a thousand forty six other students that participated in the program this year as well um, and overall we're almost up to fifty five thousand students from Elk Grove who have participated in the program over the year uh, over the years it's very good the bar graph here, you can see what's taken place, the attendance over the past year since 2012. A little bit of a decline the past couple of years, but pretty steady uh, attendance with regards to the program. That's a good one. And a little bit about the program, if you're not familiar with it. Really, it is the students that participate are walking away with a better understanding of not only our Constitution, but about their rights and responsibilities as citizens and the importance of standing up for the rights of others. And I think also the importance about being engaged in your democracy. And I, think I always like the line that Obama had in his farewell address where he talks about um, while our rights may be self-evident like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they're not 
they're not self-executing. You, you have to go out and make the right happen. And we want to help our students become good citizens and engagement. And I think this program really does help uh, bring that about. Back up. So the program's in three parts. The students start by going out to the Constitution Wall. You've probably seen it, 140 feet wide, 90 feet tall. has the words from the Co California Constitution on it. We focus on five words, really. Uh, petition, the right to assemble, the right for instruct, uh, the right to speak, and of course the right for redress, which is uh, um, a part of the uprooted Japanese Americans during World War II exhibit. The second part of the program is where the volunteers talk about their life experiences prior to the camps, during the camps, and trying to reestablish their lives after the camps. And if you've ever been in a classroom with the students when they're listening to the programs, you can see the power uh, of the stories and how it's, it's hitting home and the relevance that, that we have with this. A couple more pictures. Um, we like this quote. I would like to thank you for uh, the once in a lifetime opportunity, an Grove student said. And it really is, uh, I think, a, a very unique opportunity to hear these stories in person and to be able to ask questions uh, of folks who were in the camps. Um, the third part of the presentation after we come out of the classroom is, is the uh, immersive experience in the exhibit. The students are down again with the volunteers talking about their, their stories with the artifacts surrounding them, the luggage that was used to, that they, they putting their personal belonging in, examples of personal belongings that, they, that folks could take to the camps. Uh, Life in the barracks, there's, re, uh, uh, re, there's a barracks there, which is also uh, impressive for the, the students. And then what life was like, the leisure activities, recreational activities that took place. And so uh, it's a great program. If you haven't seen it, I invite you to the California Museum to sit in with it sometime. Uh, it's, it's a very good one. And, and just I want to thank you personally for uh, uh, the partnership and this great experience that we're able to offer the students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron, for that uh, uh, overview. And uh, again, I, I say this for the record. Uh, the Elk Grove Unified School District Board is one of the first ones to early on support the concept that the Constitution needs not only to be taught as an example, but the future generations must learn to become active, participating citizens. Now more than ever, we have to in, incorporate those responsibilities early on. And I think many teachers agreed that fifth grade was a good time because if you wait until high school, we know that mindsets are already established, patterns, and if we're going to keep the Constitution and our individual rights as they are, this board, early on, as early as in the 1980s, has made that choice. And I want to thank you on behalf of not only the community, but for future generations, because you have established not only a pattern and a precedence, but the kind of support that I wish more school districts would follow. And I keep repeating this, hoping that more school districts will sponsor programs like this at the same level that you do. And each one of you at some point has come and visited and talked to the kids. And I want to thank you deeply from the bottom of my heart because you represent the hope for the future. And I am so pleased and honored to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for keeping it in the forefront and your, your persistent and consistency with it. Thank you so much. Okay, next we have a student expulsion. I want to ask anyone who wishes to address the board in closed session regarding the student expulsion recommendation. Okay, seeing none, uh, I'll call for a motion to approve the request. So moved. Moved by Mr. Perez, second, second by Mr. Forcina. All those in favor? 
Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, a public comment. I want to call on Dr. Kerr. Okay. Good evening, distinguished board, um, Superintendent Hoffman, Arevalo. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to say thank you. I know I was here last year and talking about our need for a new school for Franklin Elementary and it was great to see many of you at the a groundbreaking ceremony and as the school year comes to an end, I wanted to formally come and address the board and to say thank you just truly not only on behalf of myself um, but our community as well and I'm really, really glad to see that we've gone full circle with that. We're excited to um, see the build and we'll be watching that throughout the year. We just ask the board, um, the district and the administration to continue to maintain the transparency w with our community. And if we could be of service, we would love to help. And uh, we uh, continue to look to build that partnership and continue to collaborate on building that trust. Thank you. Did you want to say anything, Lo? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and in case you guys do get behind schedule, as you know, he was holding that shovel with cash. And then he was <laughs> 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 Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Antonio Ferrero, come forward. Ferrago? Ferrago? Excuse me. I think that's. Hello, I'm actually Jensi Ferraro. My name's on there, but uh, my husband would like me to go first. Um, I am here today with a tremendous disappointment in my heart. I am very proud to have five children that are currently in the Oak Grove Unified School District, but I have unfortunately been failed by the inactive response to any kind of anti-racist curriculum in this school district. Our children are at Edna Beatty Elementary, and they are feed into the feeder school of Pleasant Grove. Last year, I went to every town hall, I went to every meeting that was possible to hear and be hopeful that there was going to be a change and that something was going to happen so that my little ones could then go to a high school and feel safe against any kind of racism. At that time, I went in and talked to my principal. How can we get the young ones? How can we do this? Let me help you, I'm a former educator. I can help you, let me, I can donate money, donate time, how can I help you? They gave us suggestions, gave books, and kind of got like a, a vague answers. And then on January 28th, while I was on the, proudly at the Alliance Redwoods field trip with my sixth graders, my daughter was called a nigger. Thankfully, a friend of hers was taught how to be an abolitionist against racism and brought that up to me immediately. My daughter endured a ton of embarrassment from this moment on because the teachers did the best they could, but it wasn't enough. They had no idea how to manage the situation, and by thankfully, there was one African-American teacher there who was able to breathe life into my child and let her have, her, keep her the self-confidence that she had when we left for that trip. That night, I had to sleep in the bunk bed with my 12-year-old, who is an independent and beautiful and doesn't need to sleep with her mommy anymore child. She was hurt, she was embarrassed, and she did not know what to do. None of the students around her knew what to do. I watched you nodding your heads as the California Museum suggested that it is our responsibility to make kids good citizens. And at Edna Beatty Elementary School, they are failing at that mission. On April 26th, I got a phone call about our son, our 10-year-old son that he had physically acted out in an unacceptable way to another student. I do not agree with my son's choices, but when I asked why he was so upset, I was answered with, we don't know that side of the story. 
When I got home, I found out that the substitute teacher for PE that day was pushing the students, and this is from another parent, not my child, pushing the students, was being racist towards my son, and two little girls said that they heard her call my son the N-word under her breath. The classroom then went back to talk about this, and he was humiliated. Shortly after, another student called him the N-word. It was too much. It's unacceptable. Now, my son was the one that was suspended. And it's on his permanent record. And at this time, my husband, Antonio Ferraro, would like to follow up, please. Good evening. Thank you for giving us this time. Um, I mean, I heard a lot of great things going on, and I hope you see that our stories, I hope you see it as an opportunity for even greater greatness. Um, I want to start with some quick background. Jency and I moved to Elk Grove about eight years ago from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, we have five African-American children growing up in suburbs of Cincinnati, mostly white community. We could do it, but we knew we could do better for them. So. Sacramento has some of the best neighborhood diversity in the country, quite honestly, if you look at the statistics. We love what we have at Elk Grove. So that's why we're here. We've been here for eight years. Um, it truly is a remarkable place. I left a career at Procter & Gamble. I've been lucky enough to have continued success with E&J Gallo down in Modesto. And there's a quote that Ernest Gallo said um, some time ago, asking about the success and how did he do it? How did they become the largest winery in the world? He said, we didn't do the impossible, we did the obvious. And that's what we're here today. Jency and I are here today. We need your help in doing the obvious. So as Jency stated, we are asking for sensitivity to a real issue. We are asking for improved training and tangible action plans on how to mitigate. Lastly, what I want to talk to you specifically then tonight is asking for help in adjusting the suspension policy. So on the day the N-word was flying around school at Enzo's gym class, he ended up pushing another kid. He got suspended. We didn't argue with the suspension, okay? Maybe it was severe, but we didn't argue that. So he was wrong, he served his time. Now, I'm asking specifically that his suspension be removed from his, quote, permanent record. I ask, when does the punishment end? I ask you, what good does it do to have the actions of a 10-year-old little boy on his record going into junior high and high school? Ian, uh, staff have told me no one looks at it. I say, great then take it off if it doesn't matter if nobody looks at it. Others say, well, if there's a pattern, it's helpful to see the pattern and, and keep other kids. Okay, great, then have it rolling one year, rolling two years. But if there's no pattern, then take it off. What good does it do, especially in today's, you know, Elk Grove is more sensitive to this kind of issue than anywhere. What good does it have him carry his action as a 10-year-old into high school and on his permanent record? With everything we know about criminal justice issues, inherent bias, my little black son is playing right into some of the statistics we all know. To me, if I'm thinking about any student, the potential downside of this, of having a suspension on your record for an entire school career, are far greater than the upside. At the end of the day, we aren't asking for the impossible. We are asking for help in doing the obvious and doing what's right. Thank you. Okay, Noel. Cameron. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Hoffman, Hoffman uh, and uh, members of the Elk Grove Unified School District School Board. Um, I'm, I'm going to raise this a little first. Um, I, I just wanted to come in and talk with you a little bit about, and it's actually, it's, it's coming along on a similar topic. Um, I was left disappointed and frustrated with the actions of the Elk Grove um, uh, Edna Beatty uh, Elementary School uh, Administration. Um, at a PTA meeting, I believe it was on, I think it was on uh, January 29th of this year, um, it was revealed during the course of the PTA meeting that um, during the naming, um, the naming process for the, uh, the school mascot, the, the Beatty Bobcat, uh, they're trying to pick a name. And so kids were allowed to 
put in names, and, and then they chose one at the end of that time. Um, what had come to light during the PTA meeting was the fact that there was a large number of names that were submitted that were actually racist in nature. I was a little perturbed by this, um, and then when I followed up with the administrator who attended the PTA meeting, um, there was no plan to even try to address the behavior, to try and educate the, the, the students. Um, not that it's, you know, I don't think that there was a way to isolate who submitted what name, but that should have been a red flag. And so myself and another parent caught up with the administrator who attended the PTA meeting and asked, um, well, first made our, made our concerns known, and then we asked if there was gonna be any follow-up, um, and then it, initially there was some humming and hawing about it, and then it was left at, well, I'll take it up with the principal, and then we'll come up with a plan and we'll come back with that. So we're about four months later, no plan, no addressing, and I th it feels like we're just waiting on this to just roll on by until the next incident happens. So when I saw that, when I hear about things that are happening to, to other students um, in this particular school, um, in this school district, I think it needs to come to the attention of this body, and I think that, that a plan needs to be developed. Um, I think we have a lot of people who are willing to try and help and, and collaborate and try and come up with a way to, to make something happen. But right now, the inaction that I'm seeing is deeply concerning. It's leaving me disappointed, frustrated, and um, one of the reasons that I also moved to this neighborhood um, was because, again, of the diversity. This, was, this is a great place. Um, I heard great things about it. Um, and so I'm hoping that this body will, will look at these stories, incidents, see the pattern, and then hopefully we can come up with a plan forward. Thank you. Uh, Edna, uh, Edna Beatty. Yes, sir. Superintendent Hoffman, do we have an uh, elementary representative here? Okay. Oh, and Miss Avey's here, too. Thank you. Oh, Sh Charmin Seely. Uh, my name is Charmin Seely. I'm a parent here in Elk Grove Unified School District. I have four children within the school district. Thank you very much for letting me speak to you this evening. I come to you to follow up on some emails and a formal complaint that I've filed for, with the district. I am one of several families who you will hopefully hear from in the next several weeks. Um, specifically speaking about Helen Carr Costello Elementary School and a teacher there in the fourth grade. Her name is Pamela Trice. My fourth grader was assigned to her classroom this year, and my concern is for his welfare, of course, as his parent. My other students have not had any troubles at the school over the time that we've lived here for nine years. But I am bringing this to your attention as a follow-up because I am concerned for her disparaging and belittling behavior to my student, as well as the five other boys that I know of that have been removed from her classroom this year. Um, I feel that is, I felt very strongly to bring this to your attention because it has been an ongoing problem um, and she has a reputation for this pattern of behavior and I would like it to be addressed. And I am asking this evening that you not only address it but I recommend that she be removed from a classroom setting. So that is what I'm asking for this evening but I'd like to talk a little bit about why I feel this way and what my experience has been so that you're fully aware of what was going on and this was my experience. Uh, my 10 year old has been gate identified and has always been on the honor roll. He has, uh, when he, his name was posted on the list for her classroom, um, he was in tears, just full tears and just distraught. After he, we came home from just checking in August for his classroom, uh, the first week, two weeks of school, he would come home frustrated, aggravated, and just 
saying, Mom, she's just so mean. And I said, well, you know, this is going to be a tough year perhaps, but you've got to learn how to understand and learn from in this setting. Well, as time went on, I have volunteered in the classroom for years. She would allow me very brief times helping, but then she asked me specifically not to come back. I, by November, um, she specifically did not ask for parent-teacher conferences, so I just emailed her and said, I am coming. And when I left to go to this parent-teacher conference, she said, or I asked my son, what would you like me to talk to her about? And he said, Mom, please just ask her not to embarrass me anymore in class. And it broke my heart. And so I, I spoke to her verbatim with his comments and his, you know, his obvious disparagement in classroom. Well, I started asking around to other parents and other families and said, is this, an, is this a problem for you? Is this a problem for your kids? And they said, yes. So I said, will you please report it? Well, we spoke to the principal, to the vice principal. I spoke to her directly. In fact, I brought the communications um, back and forth. I'm going to need you to wrap up. So. Yes. And so by February, I had had enough. I pulled him out. We've done the virtual academy. He is coming on Thursday to receive his honor roll award for the third trimester where he was getting F's and C's in her class. There's more going on than meets the eye, I think. And I brought it to your attention in hopes that we can make a change in this classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Josetta Venegas. Good evening, um, I'm a parent. This is my daughter and she goes to David Reese Elementary School. Um, I'm here tonight because of the curriculum. I'm very upset about it. Um, I was unaware that the curriculum was changing and I later found out that it was the district that was to notify the families and the district had outdated information for me. So I did not even know. I didn't know of all the previews that have already occurred. And um, when I found out, I took time off work and went to the principal's office. I spent an hour talking only to be told that the district has advised principals to send parents to the district. When I, when I came to the district, I came here, I took more time off of work. I came to the district and it was like a top secret was being discussed. I came and I was asking for the curriculum and it was very hush-hush, whispers, and what I was given were materials that are currently being used. I wanted to see what is intended to be taught to my daughter and it was like I was asking for highly confidential information. And as a parent, for all parents, we should know what's being taught to our children. When I, while I stood there, a worker came in and heard me and tapped me on the shoulder and very discreetly whispered, if they don't give it to you, ask for the supervisor. So it felt like, I felt very, it, it felt like, what is going on here? This is my daughter, not, th these are our children. And I, I once felt that the school and I were a team and that we worked together for our children. And now I feel like I have to, protect and save my child from the school and the district. I feel like we're no longer a team and now that it's the enemy. When I asked my school about the curriculum, they did not have knowledge or material of what's to come, but will be implemented next school year, just months away. I, I felt that as a parent, it was my responsibility to tell other parents. And so I took more time off work. I went to the school. I started to pass out information and let them know. And they, I was told to get off campus. I went to the sidewalk and I tried to let parents know. And I did as much as I could by myself because no one knew, no parents knew. And I talked to several parents. I then went door to door doing as much as I could and still trying to manage coming home, taking care of my kids, making dinner and going to work. I did manage to reach some parents and raise a pinch of awareness that caught the attention of our principal. So she did raise concerns and now our school has sent one email for a meeting to view the curriculum that will be taught next year. But this meeting is from 1.30 to 2.30. 
why is the viewing occurring during work hours? I'll have to take off more time off of work to come and view the curriculum. I'm sorry? There's a three minute limit if you could wrap up. Please. Oh, wow, okay. My issue most first was that parents didn't know. And when I tried to bring awareness, it was like I wasn't allowed to. And so I had to go to the street. And so my thing is that I understand that this is a, a state adopted curriculum and I, I understand that there, this has to go even farther. But for notifying parents, there should be like we get notifications for math night events, school events to happen and to occur after work hours, after 530. This should occur when it's curriculum that is being adopted that goes against the majority beliefs. Mr. Now, Mr. Megan, I hate to cut you off. Can you touch base with Mrs. Cerruti back there about this subject matter? Ms. who? Mr. Cerruti. Mr. Cerruti? Yeah, just. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank but you. Do you, I, we got parents it. need to know. Right. Thank parents you. need to know. And schools should be allowed to tell the parents because I was told to come to the district. They wouldn't give me any information. They would not let me view anything. They kept telling me to come here. So. Okay. Thank you. That is, thank you. Lorraine Pryor. First of all, it's always a pleasure to come before you because we actually have some things to discuss. Um, first, I want to start with a quote. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I believe this district is doing nothing when it comes to racial harassment and bullying. You've met some of my parents who submitted a complaint to BYLP, the Gen Gen C and um, her husband. Um, we will be walking with them through the process of getting their issue ad addressed and addressed appropriately. What I don't like as an advocate in this community is when your staff or your schools keep things from the greater public. When you have racial town halls or racial forums which occurred for Consumnist Elementary, I would like to be invited to those things because there's obviously a problem in Elk Grove Unified School District when it comes to black children being bullied. There is a, a thing where you all, um, I'm sorry, not you all, your staff seems to think if they ignore it long enough, it will go away. There is a punishment of black students when we never ask what happened to make them do what they did or how they reacted. I had a chance to sit in with some students over at um, one of your elementary schools and I sat in the room with some black girls and they told I, I said You know because I was brought in to kind of talk to them about their behavior and when I when I asked them Well, what's going on here? They said The yard supervisors get in our faces They make comments like I'm not your mom. You're not going to disrespect me They tell me I should be like so-and-so so-and-so is not black I don't see myself represented. And then every week I come up here and I talk to you all about having representation on your campuses, not just as yard supervisors, janitors, lunch ladies, but teachers actually capable of teaching students. And when I mean, when I'm saying teachers, I'm talking about black teachers, foundational black Americans. I'm talking about people who actually have the insight and the expertise to deal with this demographic of students that you all seem to have a problem with. I'm confused as to why we hear story after story after story and there's yet to be some sort of framework put into place to protect these students who are suffering from racial bullying. What do we have to do? I've been talking with you all over a year. I've made myself available. In a minute here, I'm gonna have to start charging folks because I'm always busy with stuff like this. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable that we expect elementary school students to be able to handle this type of foolishness. And I'm expecting a change and I'm ready to work. Let's go. Excuse me. 
All right, we have the consent agenda. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Albiani. Like a call one, for. Excuse me, one. Sorry. The item 30, Title I school wide. Can we take that off for a moment? Yep. For a discussion, and we'll put it back on. Like to call for a motion to approve items 1 through 30 minus 1 through 40 minus number 30. So moved. Moved by. Second by Mrs. Uh, Singh Allen. All those in favor? Aye. I would also. Oh. I made a mistake. Well, we have to remove item uh, has 23 has been removed. I'd like to call for a motion to approve item number 23 from the agenda. To pull it? Oh, okay. Nope. We already approved it. But we need to pull 23. Yeah. 23? Yeah, we don't, we don't have to take a vote to do I don't have to say anything? No. Okay. It's pulled already. Okay. Okay, it's been moved and second. <coughs> yeah, All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carry. Okay. <coughs> On item 30 of Title I, uh, I just wanted to bring, I, the superintendent and I have discussed this uh, several times, and uh, the five elementary schools that successfully operated under the Target Assistant Program, and now they have become a full Title I school coming next school year. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, my concern is, is on the aggregate scale where we're grouping all these Title I schools and some of them much better than others. And my concern is the ones, some of the old Title I schools that are not doing well and they continue not to do well and the current intervention that we are allowing and some $1.2 million we're spending is simply not really working well in some of those schools. So I guess my question is, probably Ms. Mr. Cerruti's not here, Ms. Larson, uh, what is maybe the plans in the future of how we're gonna address the intervention? I know I discussed it with the superintendent as well too, but I just wanted to bring this on the floor a little bit because we do have some problems out there with certain schools that are not doing well at all. Yes, so um, I, can, I can tell you that um, we will be bringing the board a comprehensive um, look at what we've been doing over the last six months and what the plans are moving forward with regard to something that we're calling the Title I Task Force. So we convened a group of um, myself, uh, Ms. Hayes, and school directors to do some initial work around a, really a deep dive on the data. We are, we, uh, quite honestly, we knew what the student achievement data was, so it didn't take long for us to just reaffirm that, but we looked at other kinds of data too in terms of trends in um, how we spend the money, trends in staffing, trends in leadership, trends in um, curriculum, the, all those kinds of things. We really wanted to get a good look at what, what have we, we focused on our original 12 because we could go back as far as we could, uh, we could go back further. So we, we took a look at what have we been doing over the, uh, over the time that we, I think we looked at about six years. The next thing that we did is we, took a really hard look at what the data is and what the research tells us about turnaround schools, um, schools that uh, tend to be high poverty, um, schools that have high numbers of English learners, and we looked at the research on what happens in schools that actually turn around, that they, 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 they are successful in those, um, with the, in, under those conditions. Um, so that, with that we did, we had a look at uh, what was common across the research and what also connected to some of the things that we're already doing here so we wouldn't be thinking like let's just throw the baby out with the bathwater, but see what we're doing that we could maybe improve on or strengthen or broaden or whatever. So we ended up with this, with a document that basically tells us what's our future, what's our desired state? If we were perfect, what would we be? And what's our current state? Where are we now with all these data points that we looked at? And we started in on, so we, we identified our gap. So we're gonna, we're, we, we use the DMM process to, to work through this. We identified our gap in a couple of causes, but we stopped there because we wanna now expand the Title I Task Force to include practitioners. So we want principals 
So we're taking that small group, we're making it a larger group, and we're going to take practicing principles starting this summer through December to we'll catch them up on the data, we'll catch them up on we, where we are um, right now with um, what the task force has done, and then we will take them through finishing the DMM process as practitioners. What is it that, uh, what is it that, that they think are causing some of the outcomes that we're getting now? What do they think they need um, to uh, effectively make change at their schools? What do we have to do differently? Um, where, what has to happen at schools? What has to happen at the district office level that's markedly different than what we've been doing? Um, in addition to that, we did make two decisions um, centrally that uh, for change that starting next year. One of those is that we were, we're going to take um, all of the uh, Title I staff that is identified as academic intervention teachers, so teachers who are supposed to be doing intervention with kids, and we, uh, have, we're requiring them to come here for central training uh, to learn how to identify students in a, in a way that's consistent across schools. Uh, in a way, and to um, examine curriculum, so there's equity in curriculum across. What are we? T how? Who are they? How are we picking kids to intervene? What curriculum are we using? How are we monitoring, and how do we exit them back back into programs? How do we communicate? So we're we're taking a um, a little bit more of a of a, a centralized approach to that. The second thing we're going to do is we are also going to do the same kind of thing with with staff who are hired as family liaisons, um, with, and they're going to be uh, receiving. Centralized training with our family and community engagement folks. So again, we're going to try to standardize some of the practices so we can, so we can support the work that's out at the schools. But we also don't have the wild west on you know um, someone's doing one thing and someone's doing another thing. So we can learn from what's happening at the schools and capitalize on the things that are do going well, and then also um, boost up and support some of the schools where um, they need some extra, some new ideas, some new skills. So. That's what it's going to look like. You guys, I hope, kind of spoiler alert, I gave you the preview, but you guys will get some details about that, uh, I believe, this summer. And so we'll go through that in, in much more detail. We'll share the data with you. We'll share the research um, outcomes with you. And we'll let you know um, how the work's going with our principals. Well, I appreciate that and uh, to hear that. I, I've, my conversations with the superintendent, my feeling, you know, we've got to do something more courageous and out of the box thinking, uh, I'm convinced these kids can learn. Absolutely. But will it be easy? Uh, probably not. But if we have the right leadership and the right people there, we can make some headways on these because it it really bothers me when I look at the grade level that some of these a few of these schools are at. It just kind of tears me apart inside that we have simply got to do a better job in putting our resources. And I think it's, it's, for me, it's not really a money issue. It's, it's part of the curriculum delivery, the leadership, just a, a number of things that's in there. So I appreciate your comments on that. Thank just, you. So one other comment, just to make sure, um, I've had this conversation with, uh, with President uh, Madison to make sure my commitment to the entire board. As uh, more schools qualify um, for, um, Inclusion in Title One, and we you know, we yeah. moved our secondary schools in where we didn't do that previously. So we've we've uh, uh, modified that model. Uh, we will not lose track of um, our original Title One schools, and we won't allow data to um, look like it has gotten better simply because uh, different schools are included in the um, in the measurement. So we will make sure that uh, we pay attention to to the original. Um, schools and we're looking at improvements across all those schools as well as uh, the other schools that are identified more newly within Title I. That, that's a commitment you have from me. Well, I appreciate that and that's, that's, that's the part that I wanted to bring up and so we all can discuss it a little bit. Ms. Perez. Um, I have some questions. <laughs> and, and and uh, number two, you mentioned boost up support. What do you mean by boost up support? Um, I was I was generalizing um, with regard to the two positions that we typically have at our Title I schools. One of them is the academic intervention teachers, and the other is uh, parent liaison. So when I say boost up support, so it, what I really mean is the centralized training and. Um, direction that we'll be providing for those two positions. 
So one, one, one piece I just want to uh, make sure uh, we don't get ourselves um, into a spot in that this particular item tonight is specific to um, schools that um, now qualify with regards to Title I. It's not actually an um, agendized item to discuss the interventions and work that we're doing with Title I. Uh, that will be part of the, um, the work uh, at the August uh, workshop. It's going to be, that's when uh, the team is going to bring um, the work that we've done so far, uh, the work we're planning to move forward and getting feedback from the board. So it'll be a robust, very deep conversation, but that's, it's actually not agendized to have a conversation with regards to what we're currently doing in Title I and what the plan is moving forward. It's only about qualifications for the schools that now qualify. So I just want to make sure we don't get ourselves um, off track on that particular right. topic. There is a workshop in detail. But I don't think my workshop. question was out, out of line or off. It's concern. I'm concerned, you know, like what's, but the future, so you mentioned that we're going to have a proposal for more Title I schools for the that's district? What this, that's what this item is. These are schools so that besides, now qualify. Besides the ones that we have now? Correct. So, okay. And those will be at the elementary, junior high, or high school? That's the item. That's what the item These is. Are all, all elementary, okay. I just want to get clarification. Okay. And so... To um, you mentioned, um, we, we probably went too far, even following up with Mr. Madison's questions with regards to well, program changes. Now, well, yeah, that's, we're doing. That, that's an issue, but it's, that but it's coming. But it, but it is going to be a When you go too far, if I go too far, it's an issue. But Mr. Madison has privilege as a chairman to go that far. And when I want to answer, I'm calling questions. him. I'm calling. I'm just. I'm just putting it out to the entire board that we just have to These be careful just, okay. in having a conversation okay. with concerned. regards Mr. to something Perez that's not on the agenda. From an aggregate standpoint that I brought up, but we will go a deep dive into this. And, right, and, I understand and that, but uh, uh, but like you know, it's that's agenda item. But I want to get some clarity to some of the statements of which were stated earlier. Some clarification, okay. okay? And right, like I said, I wasn't sure. You, when you throw out a support system, I like to know what do you mean? Is it two positions or training? You mentioned, yes, you're going to have training for staff, correct? And you mentioned uh, look at possibly the curriculum, analyze the curriculum, maybe change the curriculum development. No, I didn't say we were going to maybe change the curriculum. But um, I do want to be clear that the schools that are the, the that the schools that um, item 30 is regarding are schools that were identified as Title I schools this school year. They already were, but they were, they were targeted assistance, meaning there were specific students that received interventions. Right. They went through the process, and then next year they will be school-wide, which, which means they can Title provide one. programs across the school to all the students. And, so that, and, that's, in your, and that's in your packet. So, okay, again. You said we are providing Title I at schools just individually to individual students who, who, who meet the criteria for Title I, correct? That's what but targeted you, assistance Okay. Is. Then you said that there's, we are most likely, I'm not sure I'm clear about this, that the whole school might be Title I. That is what's happening. That after, is what's happening, okay. Right. That's what that's item right. 30 is that is up for um, okay. the right. consent agenda. So why is it that? Now that, and what, how, how long have you been serving Title I individual students in the old schools? One year. One year. Now we're, okay, and, but yet, okay, now then we're going to jump and, and serve the whole school in Title I. Correct. They're all going to, that school's going to get, elementary school's going to get Title I status, and the whole school, every child in that school is going to have Title I status and services. Correct. All five schools. Okay. Okay, great. Very good. Okay. Um, I'm not finished. <laughs> um, so, of those five schools, how, how, many, how much money goes, how much of our supplemental concentration money goes to those, those schools? I like to, okay, if you can't answer that question, I like to have staff provide that to us. And also, all title schools. I'm, I'm very interested in Title I schools, how much supplemental and concentration more than, the, you know, are they getting at those schools more, and compared to other schools that aren't, are not identified as Title I schools? 
Yes, yeah, it is in the LCAP. That information is in every school site's LCAP. So the LCAP has all that. But I like to see an Excel file of those uh, schools that are Title I and how much we call Title I funds and how much supplemental concentration but monies are like, like that. So I think that's doable. Yeah. So, okay. Because, you know, like we are supposed to be concentrating on Title I schools and giving them extra monies. We are, and we do. Okay. But Mr. Madison, Chairman, Mr. Madison, um, I disagree with you. I think it is a money issue. You know, California ranks 58th in the nation of student funding, and and, and, and statewide. Yeah, let's. Yeah, we're not going to talk okay, about okay. funding. Okay. Okay. And, and money is an issue that students are not getting good outcomes, and unless we invest in our students, like other states. We have, we'll have better outcomes. We'll discuss it too in August too. Thank you. Okay, I want to make a motion. Go ahead for item 30. Second. second. So moved and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, bargaining units. <laughs> the retiree. <laughs> and and her replacement, Rick's. And my replacement. That I did not speak. Okay. I didn't say you had to speak. Yeah. I just said you had to come. <laughs> Good evening, board members. Um, this is indeed my last official school board meeting. Uh, one, I wanted to say thank you. Um, I've met, met with many of you at uh, the various coffees, et cetera, et cetera. We've had monthly meetings, and I greatly appreciate your openness uh, to work with all of the units uh, he started high and that's something that again not all districts have and we're very very fortunate to have that open engagement so towards that um, like I said this is the end of my term we had an election and my replacement is Rick Stansel he's our, my current vice president and he is now EGA's president-elect and I wanted to present him to you Bye. I will not miss late night meetings. <laughs> Rick, yeah. would you like to say a few things? You know, I, I very quickly and briefly, I just look forward. I have relationships with most of you, uh, so I just look forward to continuing uh, to develop those and just make sure you guys all know that I have an open door policy at any point. If you ever need to call, come by EGEA. Um, I look forward to engaging. Uh, with you guys in much of the same ways that we have been and to continue that collaboration and um, you know open relationship but I just want to take a moment and just uh, on behalf I know of uh, most people all of our folks at EGE I just want to thank Kathleen for her four years of service to our association uh, she's done a phenomenal job uh, very dedicated um, and kept a, a real good focus on you know member um, involvement and, and member concerning, you know, serving our membership. So she did a great job. I know we're going to miss her, and you guys probably will too. So, okay. so you have any business cards you could share with us? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Kathleen, no one's. <laughs> we just want to mention to for the best for you for the future when you retire. Uh, I uh, I have to say thank you. She had one of my grandsons and. Uh, not only is she a good president for EGA, she's a fine teacher too, and we appreciate that. And maybe if we want to get a quick photo of her together. I just want can I say just very quickly, um, thank you. Uh, we've had uh, uh, some fun. Um, we had pie back in the day, and she actually made me a shepherd's pie, and it was it was phenomenal. Um, and we've had some tough conversations, um, and uh, and got down to uh, brass tacks a few times, but we always. Um, kept um, each other um, in mind and um, and the work through um, through Arbinger and through the partners in education I, uh, I appreciate it very much so it's been a pleasure yes ma'am
Okay, board members report, committees, any? Mm. Ms. Yep. Allen? Um, yes, thank you. I am a th a three of us, myself, Ms. Crystal martinez Oleri, and Ms. Beth Albiani. We attended um, California School Board Association Delegate Assembly this past weekend. Um, great, great two to one and a half day conference. The first day we spent the bulk of it on special education. We had a great panel discussion and then we broke off into little groups and had further discussions. But the overall themes, we discussed the ethical responsibility of school districts as it relates to special education, just the cost that's associated with it, the law, SELPAs, on um, day two, we discussed, a we had a legislative and legal update, which was great, and then of course, full and fair funding. And Mr. Um, Perez, you mentioned earlier, just briefly here on California lagging in full and fair funding. I encourage you and our colleagues to attend uh, tomorrow, uh, along with our California Teachers Association and the School Board uh, Association at the State Capitol for a rally Red, we're wearing red for Ed, and I brought t-shirts here from our delegate assembly to share with all of you. Uh, the three of us already have them, so I'm gonna pass this down. The one folded in half is for Ms. Chidas because she's, it's a smaller size, so don't take that one. <laughs> so I'll pass that on for all of you. And then I also brought um, for uh, my other colleagues, uh, there's a great booklet here put together by CSBA. It's called The Landscape of Special Education in California, so um, please take a copy of those as well. And then I only have two of these, so, um, well, it looks like only one because this has nothing in it. If maybe we can make copies of this, I'll send this to uh, Mr. Hoffman. These are just talking points for us school board members. It, there's great information and data in here as it relates to full and fair funding and, and how to message those discussions. So I'll just pass this on to Mr. Hoffman to maybe share in our uh, board communication so that everybody has this. So, um, it, there's great tips in there for when you're talking to not only elected officials, the media, your own social media engagements on what the key talking points are. So those are, it's helpful that we have a unifying message and stay on point on that. So just a great meeting and proudly representing EGUSD. I'm sure my colleagues here will have more to add. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to give uh, my brief update as well. I was able to attend um, CSBA a day earlier on Thursday or Friday. Um, there was a board of directors meeting, so we got showcased agenda ahead of time uh, for CSBA, and a lot of thorough information um, that went out to different districts. And then the breakout session, I have to thank Mark Cerruti um, for working on that with uh, Superintendent Hoffman on the information for special education, um, getting that to us in a quick timely manner. We were able to do a report out during our workshop and give an update with all our facts and figures and our numbers from the district. So it was nice because all of um, our representation was spread out in different workshops. And um, CSBA collected all the data, not just from our school districts, but any representative they had in the workshop. So they did a nice job of splitting up the different districts. And um, they said they will do an analysis and a summary. Um, we asked for that information. So that way we can share um, the different ideas that came out of that um, workshop. And I want to say the information was very thorough. Um, I was able to be a part of the directors at large meeting um, with the representation um, and being the uh, director at large for American Indian or Native American population. And I helped to contribute um, and co-author a journal article that was passed around to the delegates. And I had um, forwarded it recently to you, Mr. Hoffman, if you can send out as a BCC to the rest of the board, the article was on implicit bias. Um, however, the article I co-authored um, related directly to the Native American student population, and I co-authored that with one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Tamara Cheshire from Folsom Lake College. So um, I'll be um, making sure that hopefully spreading on that information. I sent you an earlier email with that attachment on there. Um, and then we also got to hear from Nicole Anderson 
on um, a lot of implicit bias and equity work that is being done within different districts. So um, I'm excited about the upcoming conference in December. Um, we briefly talked about that as well, and I've been in contact with Sue, and thank you again for reaching out and um, being available. Um, I'm hoping to bring some information on our Native American program to that conference as well. Um, so looking forward to uh, um, the future plans for um, the CSBA and um, serving in the role as a director at large. So thank you. Thank you. I was a freshman. It was great. <laughs> there are a lot of people, a lot of good stuff. It's been covered very thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you for appointing me. I did, I did appreciate it and learned and met some very, some very, made some very good connections. Thank good. You. Michelle Espinosa. Well, I just wanted to give a quick update on Pi, but before I do that, I just, you know, want to thank my colleagues who are spending all of this additional time furthering their own professional development and bringing that home to us. It is a huge time commitment on top of all of their existing responsibilities and we yes. really appreciate you representing us. Um, the Partners in Education group may, met, was it last week? Uh, and uh, we talked a lot about uh, how we are going to take our, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name of our training that we're doing our Arbinger training to the next level. We're finally getting to the point where we have uh, a, enough trainers, really, to, to start to, to see the numbers that we wanna see. And um, it's pretty exciting that we are going to be able to do some, some new things. So that's about all I remember. Was there anything else? Nope, uh, it was a good conversation. We do have some summer trainings already established. Um, and they'll be uh, up and running. We didn't get to do them last summer because of the, uh, by the time we got all the information worked into the uh, collective bargaining agreement. So we're excited about having summer trainings, which, will, which is more accessible for some of our staff members. So it, it'll be great. Right. So that is all. Mr. Fortin. Okay. Okay. We'll move uh, to other items on the floor. Okay. Thank you. I have two items. Um, 49 years ago, I began as a teacher in special education before moving on to principalships and assistant superintendency. Forty-nine years ago, there were discussions about the problems with the funding of special education and the fact that monies had to be taken from the general fund. Forty-nine years ago, superintendents and boards of education didn't want to talk about the problem for fear that they might alienate one group of parents against the other group of parents. And so for 49 years, nobody has talked about the problem that has continued to grow and grow and grow. We have board members who are on committees talking about the issue. Superintendent Hoffman's on committees that are talking about the problem. How does it affect Elk Grove Unified School District, we have a budget of $738 million plus dollars. We have a total special education cost of $141 plus million dollars. We are only funded in the amount of $50 million, which means over $91 million dollars 91 million dollars of money that could go to children's program, to employee compensation, to a whole myriad of issues is taken from the general fund so we can meet our obligations to special education. School districts have been taking monies away from the general fund for 49 years that I know of in order to meet their obligations to special education kids. This is not an issue of, of putting one student group needs against another student group needs, of pitting one group of parents against another group of parents. It's about California State Legislature and the governor and the federal government because in 49 years, we've had both Democratic and Republican, so it really doesn't matter uh, what your color is, stepping up to the plate and meeting their responsibilities. 
we're going to rapidly approach one hundred million dollars of contribution out of our general fund at the rate that special ed kids are being added to our roles because one of the identification of special education kids and two because of the good job that we do the fact that we do good work we get more kids people are moving here for the service and it's time that the general public know about this problem number two i ask uh, you mr president that at the august board workshop that we once again revisit and review the board handbook especially the section that deals with individual board members responsibility for being prepared for the board meetings and just giving the people whom they are going to ask questions the courtesy of asking the questions before the board meeting thank you i will say mr Fortina, your point on special ed is, is well taken very good. Uh, it's going to become a crisis before this is become a crisis. Yeah, before long. This is why we literally spent the whole day for the first time on a single subject matter. Yes, there's never meeting. been. There's actually never been more momentum uh, with regards to um, the recognition of this. Um, it, it's it's within the governor's budget currently. It's not written well. Um, sorry, governor, but it's not written well. Um, but we appreciate the dollars that are there. A lot of work is being done, and we're, we're trying to have our impact on it to make sure that it's done in the right, uh, so that all of our special ed kids, number one, show up and are, are recognized uh, within the funding formula. So, uh, so there is some momentum there, um, and that's at the state level, and even some momentum um, at, the, um, at the federal. So I've never actually been more hopeful um, with regards to um, some momentum with that uh, moving forward. Again, echoing Mr. Forshina's, uh, this is not one group of kids against another group of kids, one group of families against another group of families. This is just about adequate funding yes. and funding um, what is um, IDEA and fully funding what it is uh, we're, uh, we're responsible, um, willing, and able to do. Um, so that, that, that just a follow up there. I did have two other pieces I just want to do real quick. Yes, please. Um, just a reminder: graduations next week. It's what, it's what we're all it's what we're all about. Um, so there was a board um, a BC that went out that has your parking pass in it and all the instructions. So just a reminder: it's in there. Um, so uh, take a look. If because uh, uh, sometimes I'll get a, a panic. Um, I'll forget my. I actually physically took mine out and put it in my um, bag today. That's why I'm reminding you to do um, do the same. And I did want to point out: Miss Hayes was um, really helpful in putting together. The, uh, the dollar amount information uh, with regard for the, for, for the CSBA uh, group. So I um, always appreciate that work. So that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else? Items from the floor? No, I do. Mr. Perez? I like, I like to make a request next board meeting that Rudder Middle School students who have um, who participated in the California Geographic Alliance um, uh, GIS mapping showcase and competition, just been notified that they won four of the five places in the statewide uh, competition. We won first place, uh, and that subject matter was on the Tubbs fire that's, I'm talking about the web mapping that I've uh, supported and helped finance to have a course there at Rudder Middle School. And we want the first place who will be going to the national level to compete at the next ESRI July National Convention. And uh, we won second place, and that subject matter was on Deer Creek Hill and the Gold Rush. We won third place, and that um, story mapping was on digital literacy in Sacramento County. Uh, we did not place fourth, uh, another school district uh, in Compton won that position, which was the, the title was crime in Compton. But then we won the a fifth place was by, uh, and that su subject matter was the campfire story map. So out of, the four, out of the five positions, we won four of them. So I'm requesting, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, that next meeting that I like these kids be recognized and also that the first place winner 
um, present to the board on the tub fire presentation. It, it, it's about a three or four minute presentation that they could have here, right here in the boardroom on that screen, that first place uh, a web mapping uh, mini course uh, competition. So, so all you could learn about story mappings and how beneficial it is. It's part of um, geospatial technology that it's now re being in implemented in our school curriculum. So, in our, so right now, our students at, at Rudder Middle School are at the forefront learning spatial technical skills, which uh, I propose at a later time that we would possibly uh, set up a pipeline, elementary, middle school, high school, and then we, we already have contacts at the, at the junior college level and the state university level for a pipeline for a vocational academic curriculum um, academy for this subject, this technology. It's, 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 a, it's job skills, which it's, there's a highly need uh, job skills throughout state government, education, health. I used it health. I, I, I um, placed, well, I did a study on measles and did measles, if, uh, like I said before, <laughs> measles project, I did outreach for the Department of Health Services. So, uh, and I got award for that recognition. Also, yes, I'll be uh, at, the, uh, at the Capitol tomorrow. I'll be talking about and promoting and, and lobbying or consulting, excuse me, uh, uh, on a variety of education issues. But one I'd like to make, uh, bring to your attention, which I'll also work on, is the request to support multilingualism in California. And so, um, uh, what that is, uh, we're going to request finance, provide funding for the purpose of promoting and supporting biliteracy bi and multiculturalism for all students from early childhood through the 12th grade. Um, I'm working with a group, California Together. We, we want them to continue investment, uh, continue investment by the legislators and programs, professional learning, building bilingual teacher capacity and early childhood dual language learning are critical for preparing all our students, including English learners, to graduate with biliteracy skills and cross-cultural competencies. That's what we need in our school district. That's what you heard from the presentations from people from our community. There's an issue regarding cross-cultural understanding of people's cultural and linguistic issues. Okay. That, that's, that's, another, that's, that's very important. Um, got one more here. Uh, I misplaced it. <laughs> um, I think, oh, here's my last thing. I've been studying, and you hear me a lot of times talking about special local school funding parcel tax. Sometime, we need to sit down and talk about this issue. Like I told you before, UC Davis has that. I mean, Davis, California has that. They have one of the best schools in, in the whole region in Northern California because they tax themselves, they, get, they invest in their students, and they have good teacher pay, good staff pay, and good outcomes. So I like us as board members to discuss this issue. Maybe that we should support think of a, res a resolution or think about running uh, this campaign which Los Angeles Unified School District is doing right now. But they're going to do it in the, this next election. It's my understanding that our legislators are going to be passing a legislation to change the two-thirds criteria to tax our communities for local school funding to, to over 50%. So I just want to bring that to your attention because there is talk within our legislative bodies to uh, uh, change the law that you do not need, I think, two-thirds majority. They might just, if they win over 50%, I think 50%, that you could change the special local school funding partial tax election. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> 
Uh, and there could be a study. I think, you know, if we have so many students here that are special ed and more people coming up here, we all need to pitch in and, and, and support these students all through the, our school district. Okay. All right. And we, I'd like you to take lead to discuss this and so we could possibly fund, adequately fund our students in our school district. You know, like I said earlier, you know, we rank almost second to the last of student funding. We, we should fund our students. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, I will adjourn the meeting at 2010 hours. Thank you.